Let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And uh, we'll go down to the catechism memory work. Um, Like last week, I'll read the questions and then we'll all read the answers together for the Christian questions and answers. Do you hope to be saved? Yes. Yes, that is my hope. In whom then do you trust? In my dear Lord Jesus Christ. Who is Christ? The Son of God, true God, and man. How many gods are there? Only one, but there are three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then we'll do the Bible memory work. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And Luther's morning prayer. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. All right, so uh, in the Bible history for today, as we're making our way through the life of David, and as we make our way through the life of David, I I hope you kind of see the whole life of David as one. Um, I think with kind of the way, and, and this is, again, one of the reasons that we do Bible, that we've been doing Bible history is to try to see the whole narrative of the Bible, but even within that, to see the narrative of uh, kind of things that you might see as disparate events in in the Bible. So with David, there's tons of different facts and stories that people know about him, uh, just if they've kind of grown up in church, gone to Sunday school, right? You know about David and Goliath. You may, you know, have heard about David and Jonathan. You may have heard about David and Saul. And... Uh, you know that David was king. You've probably heard the story of David and Bathsheba. Um, you probably know that David wrote some of the Psalms, right? But all those things are kind of separated when we talk about them, right? David did this, David did that. Um, but how does that all fit together in a timeline? What is that? What is the picture of his life, right? So that's kind of what we're trying to do in order, at least. So if you kind of read it all together uh, in order through the book of 1 Samuel especially, And then we'll jump over to the Psalms at one point. Hopefully you can kind of see a bigger picture there. Um, With that said, I'm not really going to talk about David too much today. Um, What I really want to talk about today is is friendship. So I'm kind of co-opting the story of David and Jonathan, which we will kind of discuss at the end uh, to some degree. I want to make sure that we get just the basic story of what's going on here. But what I actually want to spend most of our time doing uh, at the beginning is talking about friendship. And the reason I want to do that is because David and Jonathan is the picture of friendship in the Bible. Uh, There's not really another uh, place where I think friendship is as fully narrated as it is with the story of David and Jonathan. And you can maybe make an argument that like uh, James and John or, or maybe even John and Jesus or something... Uh, were really good friends, and that and that I think those are true. But um, the way that this is, this story is is narrated and and given by Samuel is uh, shows certain aspects of friendship that you just don't get as, elsewhere in the Bible. 
And I think friendship is something that uh, for much of time in history has always kind of been taken for granted and in much of our lives is normally taken for granted. And in some ways that's fine. If, a fr- if friendship happens naturally and it happens well, then you don't really need to necessarily study it biblically. But one of the points I want to make is that our modern society has made friendship a lot more difficult, especially, I think, for men, um, at, but also as well for women, that friendship is a, is a more difficult thing to have. A true, uh, good, biblical friendship is a hard thing uh, to come by these days. And so I want to I talk about friendship today. Um, but, da- but David and Jonathan really are kind of the image of this. So at the beginning of, of chapter 18... Um, so 17 ends, Samuel, uh, and first Samuel 17 ends, David and Goliath, um, ends and the Israelites have plundered the Philistines, right? And then, uh, they kind of return back to their homes. And if you remember in the last couple of chapters, Saul's son, Jonathan has showed up a few times, right? So Jonathan is Saul's son and Jonathan showed up a few times and Jonathan and David, um, are about the same age. They're both young men. And they get to know each other. And so after the battle with Goliath, uh, Jonathan and David start to become become friends, right? And uh, this is the word that's that's used for him. And there's, uh, there's a whole number of things to talk about here. But before we kind of just jump into the story of David and Jonathan, um, like I said, I, I actually just want to kind of outline biblical friendship. Um, I'm kind of I'm kind of going more topical today than than straight from the Bible, um, just because I think this is a topic that that doesn't come up that often, and uh, this is the place to talk about it. So um, I think let's start with the word friendship. So the word friend comes uh, really from the I think the Latin word for uh, beloved, right, or to love. And the reason it comes from the word love is uh, if you go to the Greek, there are four words for love. So you may have heard of this before. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Four Loves um, that the the four different Greek words the New Testament uses for love. Uh, One is eros, which is uh, romantic love. Right, so this is kind of sometimes has sexual overtones to it, but but the romantic love, um, like the love of two young, a young couple, you know, madly in love with one another. Right, this is the romantic love, um, the kind of marital love. Uh, two, I'm I'm not going in any particular order here, uh, is storge, which is kind of the motherly love. Right, this is tender motherly love, the kind of love that a mother has toward her ch- children uh, to want to care for and, and nurture, the nurturing love, storge. And then uh, three is maybe the most famous one, agape. And this is uh, what the Bible, this is, in, interestingly, um, in the ancient world, agape is just the most general neutral love. Uh, in like ancient Greek literature, it, it's kind of a throwaway term for love. It's not as, it's not really used that much, and it's it's a very neutral kind of term for for loving something. But the Bible co-ops this. Uh, the New Testament, especially John, co-ops agape to be this this covenant, deep, intimate love. The kind of the the love that ties. Um, it, in a way, it's it's marital, but it's not uh, sexual as it is uh, covenantal, right? This is the love that ties together, and it's the, this is especially the word that is used for the love between God and, and man and his people, that, that he, he loves them so much that he will sacrifice his son for them, and they are bound, and we're bound together in this um, kind of mystical way. Uh, that, that's the agape love, right? That's the deep, uh, sacrificial, covenant, covenantal love. Um, and that, so that's kind of the big Bible one, right? That's the big one people talk about. But the last one is the one where friendship comes from, and this is uh, philia, right? 
And so you may have heard of this before, that Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. Well, Delphos is brother, right? And uh, Philia is brother, uh, is love. But they, this is the kind of brotherly love, right? This is uh, the, the friendly, the friendship kind of love that two people can have to, with one another. It's, it's not romantic, and it's not motherly, and it's not... There's aspects of agape in there, and uh, but but this is this is friendship, right? And uh, the way that this kind of gets defined is that um, there is aspects of sacrifice to it, right? So you're willing to to give up things for each other. Uh, there's also a big aspect of sharing, right? That you're sharing your time with one another. You might share your things with one another, right? You can think about little girls who are friends and they're always like sharing their various items and accessories with one another, right? Or, um, or uh, also young men, boys do the same thing, uh, share their video games or whatever it is with one another, right? Uh, you, share, you share material things with one another, you share your time with one another, you sacrifice for one another, um, but also, that you have a uh, common worldview, right? So when we the the word world worldview comes up sometimes, but it is kind of what it sounds like. Essentially, how how does one see the world, right? How do how do you conceptualize the world around you, and how do you answer the big questions in life, right? How do you uh, what are your do what what are your common goals? What do you think is going to happen when you die? Right? What's your faith in? What uh, do you think the meaning of life comes from? Right? These are this kind of big worldview things. Uh, almost always, those who are philia, like true friends, uh, have a common worldview with one another, and that is that then gives them virtues um, to build on. Right? That they have common with common virtues uh, and. The way this works out is that when one friend um, kind of messes up one of the virtues or falls into the vice of the virtue, um, the other friend is going to call them out on it, right? That you have a, a true friend is someone who uh, keeps you in line, right? Who you, it's based on virtue and you can, uh, you can keep each other accountable, right? So there's this aspect of accountability on the basis of, of common virtues. All right, which, if you think about it, doesn't always happen in these other, other kinds of love, right? These other kinds of relationships that we might have. Um, that, uh, I mean, it should happen to some degree, like within a marriage, right? But that's not the focus of the romantic kind of love. It's not necessarily to call each other out on things all the time. Um, that that's it's a whole different thing. Um, when the mother the motherly kind of tender caring of someone is not um, cer- certainly there's an aspect of discipline there, but it's not it's not an accountabil- a mutual accountability, right? It's one caring for the other. A, the covenant love is is not um, it it includes that to some degree, but if you think about God and His people, right? God disciplines us and He keeps us accountable by calling us according to His law. But it's not like we keep we don't have to keep God accountable, right? It's not that mutual back and forth. This philia, it's mutual, right? It's it's a back and forth relation. It's a two way street, right? Um, and so you can you can kind of start to think about this, and you can think about people probably in your life who you've been friends with, and who you truly are friends with, right? So uh, it it's important. One of one of the problems in our modern society, maybe not as big of a problem necessarily as some of the other ones I'm going to talk about, but one of the problems with friendship in our modern society is that uh, we are willing to call everybody friends, right? That uh, we have very loose, we're kind of loose with this term, um, when really a lot of what we have are maybe what we'd call in modern English acquaintances, right? Um, there, there's not this deep common worldview based on on virtue where we could really say, you know, I love you, right? I in this philia way, not um, not an eros way. I think one of the another one of the problems is that 
Uh, well, I'll talk about that later. But, um, but we don't have this kind of accountability, right, with people we call friends. Um, that's more of acquaintances, right? Someone in the office that you just, you know, wave at, say hi to, or whatever. Yeah, oh yeah, we're friends, you know. Uh, you know, well, do you really have that that filia friendship, right? Um, and I think to kind of go off of that, one of the things about this is that this is this is rare, right? This this doesn't happen um, constantly in a person's life. Normally, I'd say at a given time in a person's life, they probably have. Uh, one or two, if I had to guess, uh, true friends, right? And, and I think in English, the way we distinguish this is that we say best friends, right? That we have best friends. And uh, that's really what the philia uh, is about, what David and Jonathan are, are their best friends, right? And... Um, if you kind of think back through your life, you probably only have had one or two best friends at a given time. And sometimes it changes. Sometimes friends leave and new friends come, right? Um, that's definitely happened in my life. But I have I have two best friends, I, and I know exactly who they are. We were in seminary all together. Um, and uh, that kind of actually gets to the point then of how, how does this happen, right? So um, how does this happen? Well, I think... Normally what happens is people are put together in normal life circumstances. So David and Jonathan are put together because they're both uh, Israelites in the war against the Philistines, right? And uh, David is around Saul's house for the various reasons that he is. And so life circumstances put two people together, and they start to talk, and they realize that... uh, and it might start with something small. They might realize that they, they have a common worldview, a common way of seeing things about a smaller subject. So, uh, for instance, I'll just use myself as an example. Um, the guys I'm really good friends with, uh, best friends with, from seminary, when we got to seminary, we started talking, and we started realizing, and I've actually known both of them since before seminary, but um, you start to talk, and you realize that you see theology the same way. Right, that you read the Bible the same way, uh, that you think about this Lutheran theology the same way. Right, it's kind of a small uh, subject in a sense um, when you think about all the things people are friends over. But uh, you start to say, "Wow, we really like." There's a connection there, right, where we can talk about this and we we have the same vision of how this works. And then from there, you start to talk about other things in life, right? And you realize that you see the whole world the same way, right? Or not at least a lot of the world the same way, right? And you've had common experiences. And uh, you start to build that relationship, right? And there's a, a, there's a bond that forms there, that, that filial love, as you start to share time and things with one another, willing to, uh, to sacrifice your time and to sacrifice material things to, uh, to have a friendship with this person. Right, and so it kind of it start it normally starts with a smaller thing and then kind of grows grows out from there, right? Um, so that's kind of how friends are made. But um, let's see, a couple more things just generally about friendship. I want to jump back to David and Jonathan and a couple Bible things here as well. But um, let's let's talk about this here. The the final thing I want to just say about friendship very generally is um, that this is needful in our life, right? That we've, what we, one of the things we've been talking about over the, the last couple of weeks in the kings is that the Israelites and the kings need three things. They need God's word, they need good prayer, and they need good worship, right? Uh, this is another need that I think everyone has, uh, that you could list with those, and that is friendship. And Luther actually does this um, in the fourth petition of the Lord's Prayer in his explanation He, when he says, uh, give us this day our daily bread. Um, and when he starts one of his famous kind of lists of things that are daily bread that we need for this life, good friends are, is in that list, right? Uh, this is a needful thing. And why is it needful? Well, I think that 
you really can't get by in life without friends, right? Without people who are willing to kind of sacrifice their time, sacrifice their things uh, for you. And uh, to have a bond where you can share certain things with them. Now, certainly uh, the first thing the Bible cares about, if you go to the fourth commandment, for instance, so you have the love of God, then you start with the love of neighbor. What are the, um, what's the first thing that starts out in the second table of the law is honor your father and your mother, right? And um, I think throughout the Bible, family is the emphasis of the human relationships that we have, that it, everything starts with the family and then it grows out to the church and then it grows out to the society. That's kind of how the Bible envisions relationships with other people. Um, and family is important. But one of the things that happens in life is that families are sinful and families fail. And uh, when that happens, you still need friends, right? Because you still need relationships with other people. And you really can't get by in life without uh, some kind of support network of some kind, to kind of use modern language, which I don't really love to do. But um, this is, I think, needful, that... You could, in theory, a person could, in theory, their family could abandon them, right? Um, the the father could leave, the the mother could could die, and uh, the siblings could go off on their own ways, and a person could be a Christian could be left alone, right? In theory, um, but they're still going to need fellow Christians to support them and to care for them and uh, to sacrifice with them. And ultimately, they're going to need friends, right? They're going to need this, this kind of friendship. Now, I think this kind of friendship can happen uh, within families. And ideally, it does, right, between siblings, but mostly. Um, I don't think this really happens between uh, husbands and wives. And I, th- I think the reason for that is that, uh, that one thing I should say about friendship, I think, is that it, it really is supposed to be same sex, Right, um, that that a friendship is not really the the philia, right? The fact that it's brotherly love, right? It's not. It's eros is what's meant for friends who be uh, for a friendship, a love that is between a man and a woman, right? That's what eros is for, and that is only in one sense that's rare because that's generally only once, right? Um, I mean, not including, like, dating and courting and stuff like that, but marriage, eros, uh, only really is, is a one-time thing for a man and a woman get together, and then they become a one-flesh union, and that's, it's a done deal, right? Uh, but philia is, is brotherly, so it's between men and men or women and women, right? Between siblings, potentially, or... Uh, or or siblings within the church, if you will, or even potentially siblings outside the church. Um, although that's probably not as common that uh, you're probably going to share the same faith with a truly best friend, right? Because you're going to kind of have the common worldview. Um, that's just naturally what happens. Uh, and oftentimes, if people are do become good friends and they don't have the same faith, they might end up with the same faith, right? Uh, in the same way that... Uh, husbands and wives often convert for one another to to the faith, um, to someone else's faith. But anyhow, it is. I think it is a needful thing in this way that that we need we need people, right? We're meant to be social people. It is not good for man to be alone. And so, even if they're left, you know, completely uh, by their family and their family abandons them, uh, at the end of the day. Uh, they still need friends, right? So um, it's kind of a weird thing that in one way, biblically speaking, family is the most important. Uh, But in another way, in the sinful world, friendship is almost more important than family, right? Because uh, if if family fails, then friendship can still be there. Um, And if it's not there, then people are very, very sad and lonely and oftentimes uh, depressed and even worse. So uh, this is just kind of friendship in general, uh, but I think it's important that we talk about, and 
what I want to do now is to kind of jump to the Bible a little bit, maybe talk a little bit about David and Jonathan. I want to look at John, uh, where Jesus talks about friendship, and then I want to talk about the problems with friendship in our modern day society. So any questions on any of this so far or comments? Yes, Steve. I agree with, with you. Uh, I mean, I had friends that were also Christians, but then they said, well, you know, you, you're like a Calvinist too, right? And I go, well, no, I, <laughs> I don't follow that. And, and I never saw him again, you know, won't answer the phone. So, you know, it's like mm-hmm. it was a big deal to him. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. If you, if the world, if the commonality of the worldview kind of breaks down, then, um, then so can the friendship, right? And that that made me think of something else too. When you're talking about commonality of the worldview, um, this is really what, when we talk about people having things in common, we really want to look for that in philia, right? We want to look for that in kind of friendship and in brotherly love. Oftentimes, one of our problems in modern day society, I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself, is that we like to switch all these things around, right? So for, for instance, um, we, when it comes to eros and it comes to romantic partners, um, people in modern society want put a big emphasis on having things in common. Well, that's actually really not that necessary for eros. Uh, if, if a Christian man and a Christian woman um, of marriageable age and of reasonable attractiveness to each other uh, can, can get together and can be bonded in marriage and have children, even if they don't have a lot in common, they're going to learn to love each other, right? Um, maybe I'll get kicked off the internet for saying this, but arranged marriages worked, okay? <laughs> People learn to love each other. And um, you, you don't necessarily have to have a bunch of same hobbies in common, right? But one of the reasons this happens in modern day society is because marriage is often postponed, uh, where people develop a lot of these various things in life. Anyway, um, don't need to go there, but we kind of mix that around. Like commonality and common like hobbies and things, um, that is much more fruitful for philia, for brotherly love, for friendship, than it is for eros, right? You know what you have in common when you're a husband and wife? You have your kids in common, right? I mean, you'll, you'll find a way to get along. Um, but another, and another way that we do this, right, we mix these around. This is the second example I'll give, is that uh, we often mistake agape uh, with, with, with eros. We get those confused. So we think of um, our relationship with God as almost a romantic relationship. And... Lutherans are better about this because we're much more stoic Germans and we don't like that as much. But like the Baptists, for instance, or the non-denoms, right, with the kind of contemporary worship and all of that, um, it's, you know, kind of like love songs to Jesus, right? And um, that it's very emotional based, that my faith is about how I feel about God, how do I feel that God feels about me, um, you know, it's kind of like a teenage girl, like, oh, does he still like me? I don't know, you know. Um, th- this is kind of one way that this happens in the modern church is that people think of, they, they just think of love. They think God loves you. God is love. And that's filled with a bunch of kind of eros emotions, right? Um, but that's not really the case, uh, that God's love is this this covenantal love, this this binding love that is, there's a mystical union to it. Anyhow, um, so we kind of mix those around sometimes, but but yeah, having having a commonality, having a common worldview, a common faith, um, I think really does contribute to the fruitfulness of a philia relationship. Okay. All right. Um, so let's jump to the Bible a little bit. The the David and Jonathan story, the phrase that gets thrown around a couple times to describe. Their, their friendship is that uh, they become good friends and um, Jonathan, uh, so you can see this in a couple places, Jonathan loved him ha- as himself. And um, so, John- so Jonathan loved him as himself. So Jonathan made a pledge with David because he loved him as his own soul. So Jonathan loved David as himself. David loved Jonathan as his own soul. Um, what does this remind you of? 
right? Um, this is the second great command, right? Uh, so the first command is uh, love God, right, above all things. And then the second command, right, the golden rule, love your neighbor as yourself, right? So this is the way that Jonathan and David's friendship is described, is that they love each other as themselves, right? That whatever they would give to themselves, however they would take care of themselves, they're willing to do for one another. And so uh, I want to I want to say that friendship. Um, this isn't the only way that we love our neighbor as ourselves, right? It's not only philia, because um, loving your neighbor as yourself. If you expand out the second table of the law, right? Honor your father and your mother. You shall not commit adultery. All these things. It also includes aspects of of these other kinds of loves too, right? It includes eros and storge, um, and and these kinds of things that the love of neighbor has has to do with um, more than just friendship, but uh, friendship certainly has to do with the love of neighbor, right? That one of the ways that we love our neighbor as ourselves is that we do have friends. Right, that we don't neglect this gift that God has given us in good friends, and uh, that we love each. And the it's interesting that David says that he loves Jonathan as he loves his own soul. Right, that this is it's not just um, kind of a bodily, physical, chemical in your brain type of thing. This is uh, something that's going on in in the people's hearts and their souls. Right. When they're when they're truly friends with one another, um, and so uh, it's I, again I, I just want to make the point that um, that loving your neighbor as yourself, the second great command, part of fulfilling that I think is um, this this kind of friendship, this kind of filia, brotherly friendship that you can have, or sisterly friendship that you can have with other people. Right, and and you can draw that out from the commandments as well, right? So the the commandments are negative things. So don't do this, don't do this, right? Uh, don't don't commit murder, don't bear false testimony against your neighbor. Well, what's the what's the flip side to that? What what is the positive side to that? That you care for each other in their body, uh, that you that you care for each other by telling the truth to one another, right? Um, and building each other up. Well, what's one of the places that that happens? Well, it happens in a kind of best friendship, right? Um, remember this kind of virtues idea and accountability um, and, and sacrificing uh, time and energy with one another, right? Um, even building each other up in their bodies, right? So um, one of the things my best friends and I would often do is go to the gym together during seminary, right? And the reason we do that is to keep each other accountable to go to the gym and to strengthen each other in, uh, you know, screaming at each other to work harder, right? Um, this is this is a kind of friendship that, um, not to sound like too pious about myself, but that I mean that is fulfilling the the fifth commandment, right? This is uh, the way, one of the ways in which God has given us to love to love each other, right? Um, so the the love and love your neighbor as yourself. Um, it includes very, I think it includes various kinds of love, um, and I think the word Jesus uses when he says that is from agape. I'd have to double check that, but I'm pretty sure he uses agape, um, which agape really is the most kind of broad, general term um, as well. It, it is the most expansive, um, but I think it also includes. Uh, this kind of philia and even the storge and the and the eros as well, depending on the vocations that you're talking about, right? Um, so you you are required to love in this way, I think, according to God's command. And you can see that in David and Jonathan that they they literally love each other as themselves, right? As the commandment goes. Um, the next biblical place I want to look at here is uh, John 15. So if if someone wants to turn open John 15, um, and it's verses 12 to 15. So if someone wants to read that. What verse? 
uh, verses 12 to 15, John 15, 12 to 15. Okay. This is my command that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no other, no one than this. Greater love has no one than this. That someone lays down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. All right, so Jesus uses this word um, friends multiple times, and the word is, is philia. And uh, a couple times he uses it there, he says, he says different things. So he says um, that... Greater and there's a famous verse, right? Greater love has no no one than this that a man lay down his life for his friends, right? Um, that there's that the sacrifice Christ gives on the cross um, is actually because not just because he's had um, just kind of this purely agape love with us, right? But uh, that he actually wants us to be his his brothers and his sisters, right? Um, that Hebrews makes this point that Christ has become our brother, right? He wants to bring us into his family, and by doing so, he wants to have this this kind of friendship with us. And of course, it's different because he's he's God, right? So it's not necessarily the same way it all all plays out uh, with human friendships. So it's not necessarily same sex, right? Christ still call he calls women friends too, um, and we don't keep him accountable in the same way. But he does want to have this kind of relationship with us as well, that um, that he uh, wants us to be his his brothers, right? He wants us to be his siblings. Um, he wants to be he wants us to be in his family within the Holy Trinity, right? To for his father to be our father, and uh, he wants us to uh, to he wants to sacrifice for us, um, not just. In, in one sense, because uh, you know God told him to. That's the main reason. But he wants to sacrifice for us because he's called us friends, right? And that's why he says next: No longer um, uh, are you slaves, right? Is what he says. No longer are you servants, right? So if you think about kind of the the most distant relationship that a person can have, that's still a a relationship that is given as a vocation, uh, would be like master and slave, right? Um, the master has to take care of the slave, and the slave has to serve the master, but it's very much a contractual thing, right? It's, it's very much obligatory, where friendship is completely voluntary, right? Um, that, that two friends, they, they're volunteering to go into this together to be to sacrifice for one another, Right, um, it's not obligatory. Um, this is done kind of voluntarily, and so he says, "No longer do I call you slaves." So our relationship is not this kind of obligatory, necessary relationship that we may not necessarily want. Um, but I've called you friends, right? Um, that that he actually has, he's called us beloved, right? And um, beloved in the sense that uh, he cares for us in this in this brotherly, voluntarily willing to sacrifice, willing to give us um, what he has type of things, right? And we talked about kind of sharing things with one another. Well, that's what he says, right? What what I have is what my father has given me, right? And he's talking about his words, his knowledge, his wisdom, right? Um, and he's he says, now I'm giving that to you, right? I'm giving you my word. And you can kind of think about this as he's speaking to the guys who are majoritively going to write the New Testament, right? So I'm giving this, I'm giving this to you. Um, he's he's sharing with with his friends the things that he's been given. Uh, so it's a very interesting passage there uh, that helps us kind of see friendship on and maybe a little bit of a broader level too. Um, but that Jesus himself actually uh, wants to do this, right? He wants to take part in this kind of filia brotherly love, this kind of friendship. All right, um, we'll kind of continue to touch on David and Jonathan as we go along here. Any questions on the Bible stuff? Then I'll briefly touch on um, why 
why uh, friendship is so hard in modern day society. Um, yeah. So it kind of answers the question, am I my brother's keeper? Right. You know, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, if you get to a point where you're praying for your friend, mm-hmm. I mean, that is part of, you know, asking God to take care of that person. Too. Right. Yeah. 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 We are our brother's keeper, right? Um, when when Cain asked that, um, that was a kind of a wrong question. That I mean, it's not necessarily a wrong question, but the answer is yes, right? Uh, yeah. You were given to to care for your brother. Um, good point. So I want to talk about the problem of friendship in the modern world. And um, this comes down to a couple different things. Uh, we've already kind of touched on a few things. That One, we, we tend to mix up the kind of four loves. Um, if you get a chance to read Lewis's book on this, it's, it's pretty good. Um, I, I know like there's Greek scholars that disagree with it because... Um, he probably oversimplifies things, and I, I'm probably oversimplifying things with these words as well. But I think the point is is still true, um, and and we don't need to be too specific about uh, the usage of Greek words in the ancient world when we're just trying to kind of make a biblical point here. But um, but the book is good anyway. But it's called The Four Loves by C.S. Lewis. Uh, but one, yeah, we kind of mix these up is one thing. Um, but the other, the other problems that we have, um, I think the main one is hypersexuality. That our our world is is hypersexual. And what I mean by that is um, a number of things. But that in our world, people generally view love as as mostly being eros, right? They people generally view um, any kind of of relationship as sexual, and or as having at least some kind of sexual undertones or overtones to it. Um, that that's always kind of there, and you can see this in there's a there's a hundred examples I can give. Um, one of the things that I'm always complaining about is that if you walk into Target unless it's the month of February, there's bathing suits on sale, right? And I'm talking about the, the, the itsy-bitsy bathing suits um, of the, the female variety with the big pictures on the wall behind them that are essentially soft porn, right? Um, and this is constantly before our eyes, right? It's impossible to escape. And any TV show nowadays... Um, has some kind of sex scene in it, right? Um, or at least very dramatic uh, kissing scenes and things like this. Um, and then on top of that, you throw in the uh, acceptance of um, homosexuality and uh, transgender sexuality and these kinds of things where the lines of what is accepted sexuality, it's not even just men and women, but then it's men and men, or women and women, or even some other weird combination. Polyamorous is is even big now. Um, you can even, I mean, there there are people, unironically arguing that uh, pedophilia is okay because this is just the sexual orientation of people, right? That they they're sexually oriented towards people younger than them, right? Towards children. Uh, it's disgusting, right? But this is the problem of a hypersexual society: is that everything is sexual, and uh, no relationship is sacred, right? Um, that w- that every relationship has these kind of sexual tones to it. And um, I'm not necessarily talking about for every person, right? That um, that Christians can can avoid this to some degree, and that's that's good. But in society, in the world. This is the way people think. This is the way people live. Um, that sexuality is constantly in our face. Okay, so this makes friendship hard, because especially because uh, friendship is supposed to be uh, kind of same sex, right? And it's supposed to, it is supposed to be a kind of love, right? A kind of closeness, 
Um, and this is where we get to David and Jonathan more, is that David and Jonathan, like if, um, well, you can look at this picture I'm looking at, right? They're, they're hugging and um, they, they, are, they, they form bonds together, right? They touch each other and not in a sexual way, um, but they make pledges to one another. And they, at the kind of end of this story, um, David says this uh, famous line where he's sad when they have to depart ways because Jonathan's love to him was greater than that than a love of a woman, right? And modern readers, what do you think modern readers do with that? Yeah, they say it's gay, right? That's that's homosexuality. David and Jonathan were gay together, um, which... No biblical interpreter ever thought that until the 21st century, right? And and it's even it's hard for me as someone who has kind of studied the Bible as more of a whole uh, to read that and get that impression at all because that's not the biblical narrative. That's not uh, that's not the friendship that's actually presented. Um, but of course, that's what is presented in modern day society and people will throw this at you and say, well, David and Jonathan were gay. No, they weren't. They were friends, right? They, were, they had friends. And, and so friendship can become hard in this way that um, not necessarily that like if you meet someone of the same sex or whatever that you end up starting to become friends with that there's going to be some temptation to, towards homosexuality. There probably won't be. Um, homosexuality is not actually that common, but... Anyway, I can talk about why it's become more common later, but um, it's not really innate to most people. Uh, but it does just give us a hesitancy to be seen that we don't want to be seen that way, right? We don't want, and like we don't want to like like men are uncomfortable like hugging each other nowadays because of this, right? And not because of because they don't like each other, because they're not. Um, be, not because they're not good friends or whatever, but just because even something as simple as hugging has become over-sexualized, right? Um, and you can think about, for instance, uh, in in the worship service and the divine service, uh, the kiss, the um, sharing of the peace, um, that comes from the ancient tradition of the kiss of peace in the early church. And in the early church, what the kiss of peace was, was it was actually... Um, lip to lip it was mouth to mouth kissing um and it was it was gentle obviously but it it was uh, men to men and women to women right because it wasn't about eros in the church it was about philia it was about that we're all brothers and sisters in christ right and um that sounds totally weird to us and i don't i don't want to do that here um i'm not kissing any of you okay uh we're not doing that but with the pandemic, we don't even shake hands. Anymore. Yeah, right, yeah. But um, this, uh, that is where it, you know, comes from. And that seems sexual to us now, right? That seems like some kind of weird, like, um, kind of sexual practice that, that people had. Um, but it wasn't, right? It was just brotherly love. So anyhow, that that's a big problem, um, is that that our society is hypersexualized, and that makes us even hesitant, I think, to seek out friends um, because uh, if our relationship is not uh, sexual, then it's, like, not worth it or something, right? Um, and, you know, we don't want to really hang out with guys or whatever um, because we're, we don't want to we don't want to come across that way either if we're not gay, right? So uh, things like that. Um, the other the other problem I think is really hyper socialization. And um, this comes across in a number of ways, but um, one of the if you kind of rewind again back to the, like the ancient world that David and Jonathan lived in is uh, they weren't able to know as many people as were able to know and keep up with it as many people as we're able to keep up with uh, now, right? And so, and on top of that, you just had the everyday toils of life and talk about the sum in the sermon that uh, we didn't have kind of the 
the easiness of technological life that we have nowadays, and so that there were, you did have to depend on each other more, and you had to talk to real people in real life more as well, right? So before the car and the telephone, um, you had to form friendships with people that were immediately around you, right? And now we're able to pick our friends. Um, a little bit more, this kind of goes back to the arranged marriages point, um, but even it's even true on the philia level to some degree that friendships were a little bit easier, I think, when you were forced into friendships with people, right? You had to be friends with your neighbors so that you could help care for each other. Um, and, and you'd actually become deeper friends that way um, because, and it, you can even think about uh, probably the time when you were kids and I can even think about the time when I was a kid and I didn't have this stupid smartphone in my pocket all the time that that demanded my attention and that made me keep up with people that I was nowhere near in real life. But I actually had to like bike around the neighborhood with my friend, you know, and we are better friends for it. And uh, but we're just kind of hyper socialized. So it starts with like the car and uh, the automobile and with the telephone. But uh, this really ends with like Facebook, right, that we have this thing with the Internet now that and ironically we even call them friends right who's your friend on facebook right you have the friends on facebook and people apparently have like you know thousands of friends well i only have one or two friends so i don't <laughs> i don't know but um uh people have thousands and thousands of friends right friends and it's it's to- this total hyper socialization where one you don't get any of this like deep friendship right you don't get any of the the virtues or the accountability or the things that are act or the common worldview um, what you get instead is this like complete facade of a replacement of like cute puppy videos, right? And it's not it's not at all um, a true friendship, but that's what people spend their time doing. And then they and then they actually replace that, right? They say, yeah, I keep up with all my friends, right? I I'm I'm aware of what they're doing, and um, I talk to my friends on Facebook and things like that. And it's like, well, that's fine, and. You know, I'm not completely against technology. I think it's great that I can Skype my friends, um, and we, our families, Skype each other, and we're able to keep up, even though one's in Michigan and one's in Kansas, and and that's fine. Um, you know, but I I do think there's a temptation that comes with that technology, with that socialization, um, that uh, we don't uh, really have true friendships and we can waste our time on this kind of fake friendship online, right? So I tell people, you know, don't don't have only online friends. So like this is this is kind of an issue nowadays, but people will actually become friends online, never meet each other in person, and say that this is their these are their best friends, right? Um, and it's weird. It's weird. It, it's weird for me to think about um, and I'm not that I'm not that old, but to, I've talked to some younger people who this is a reality for them, that their friends are only online. They've never met them in person, right? But like with my friends, yeah, we Skype, but that's just a temporary thing. Like the the real thing is when we can actually get together in person, right? And we try and find ways every year to get together in person to maintain that friendship, just like you would with your family if you live apart from your family, right? Um that you try and get together at least once a year or something like that. Uh, so anyway, um, it's it's time to go. Uh, next next week I'll cover the actual story of what happens in 1 Samuel 18 to 20. But I think that this is a good kind of overview of friendship. And um, I hope David and Jonathan, if you read the story, and we'll cover it again, like I said, next week to some degree, uh, can kind of show you this this deep kind of friendship, one of the things that they sacrifice for is that um, Jonathan actually sacrifices his relationship with his father to some degree for this friendship. And that's an interesting thing that we can talk about um, because uh, Saul is not upholding the fourth commandment in his duties as a father. And so Jonathan actually resists him for the sake of David and Jonathan's friendship. So, um, it's a it's an interesting thing, but anyhow, let's end in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have sent your Son uh, to be our friend, to call us friends, to give us and sacrifice for us what he has and what he has been given from you. 
Uh, we pray that you would strengthen us in our friendships with one another and uh, in any friendships that we do have that you have given us as a gift. We pray that you would help us to come together today uh, to worship you in spirit and in truth and to receive your gifts of word and sacrament, which you have given to us for our good. We pray this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.